Church, Kappa Kappa Lambda Eta Sigma Alpha, Ecclesia. Followers of Christ who derived their identity and mission from Jesus and understood themselves to be the true eschatological community of God. Introduction. The Church was a new movement that arose after Jesus' resurrection. The members of the early Church sought to adhere to the confession of Jesus as Lord in the midst of an idolatrous, pluralistic culture. As family members who had been included in the new Church of God, early Christians strove for unity around the Gospel, which was portrayed vividly in the Lord's Supper. An understanding of first-century Judaism and the eschatological perspective and expectations of unity in the early church writings are essential for discerning the formation of the early church's identity in the decades following Jesus' resurrection. Designations The early Christ followers were referred to by a variety of names and terms that suggest a development of identity, 12.3, People of the Spirit, 64. The early followers of Jesus considered themselves Christians, Acts 11.26, 26.28, or members of the Way, Acts 9.2, 19.9, 23.22.4, 24.14, 22. The Essenes also used the term the way to describe their identity as a true and faithful representation of Israel's traditions, e.g., 1 Qs 8 and 12 through 14, 9 and 17 through 18. First century Jews referred to the church as a sect, Acts 24 5, 14, 28 22, a term Josephus used in reference to the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, Jewish War 2.118 through 19, 12 3, People of the Spirit, 58, 61. The most common term used in reference to the early church in the New Testament is church or assembly, Kappa Kappa Lambda Eta Sigma Alpha, Ecclesia. While this term most often referred to local assemblies of believers, Acts 5 11, 8 1, 3, 11 22, 26, 13 1, 16 5, 20 17, it could also apply more broadly to a large body of Christians, Acts 9 31, 20 28, F 1 22 through 23, 5 23, Rolov, Kappa Kappa Lambda Eta Sigma Alpha, Ecclesia, 4 13, 14. The Early Church and Judaism the early church developed its identity against the backdrop of Judaism and was intricately linked to the Judaism of its day. Jesus called twelve disciples, which corresponds to the twelve tribes of Israel, Acts 1 15 through 26, 12 3, people of the Spirit, 55. According to Dunn, Jesus forgiving sins, Mark 2 1 through 12, is no less Jewish than what was found at Qumran, Dunn, Partings of the Ways, 73, 75, Gartner, Temple, and the Community. Rather than rejecting the main concepts of Judaism, Temple, Torah, and Monotheism, the early church reworked them. The earliest believers in Jerusalem continued to visit the temple regularly, even after Jesus' resurrection, Luke 24 53, Acts 2 46, 3 3, 5 21, 42, 21 26. However, the early Christians reworked the temple concept around Christ. The temple of God no longer was to be seen as a physical building but was located in Christ and the church, his body, e.g., Acts 7, Dun, Partings of the Ways, 92, 95, 100, 08. That Peter, James, and John could be called pillars of the church, Gal 2 9, may indicate that the church saw itself as the eschatological temple, with named pillars like Jachin and Boaz in Solomon's temple, 1 KGS 7 15 through 22, 2 CHR 3 15 through 17, Dun, Partings of the Ways, 80. Many of the early Jewish Christians still sought to keep the Torah, Acts 21 20. In Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council while deeming circumcision unnecessary for inclusion in the people of God seemed to draw upon the law of Moses in requiring Gentile believers to abstain from various foods and activities, left 17 through 18, compare Bokham, James, and the Jerusalem Church, 459, 62. Paul frequently visited the synagogues and may have taken the Nazi right thou, Acts 18 4 through 8, 18, 19 8 through 9, 12 3, people of the spirit, 54, 56. Dunn contends that Paul did not reject the law but only the boundary marking function of the law, and that while he stood outside the pale of Pharisaical Judaism, he still had the viewpoint of and was an Israelite, Dunn, partings of the ways, 192, 97. Kim argues it is more likely Paul saw a problem with the law itself when he met the crucified Christ, signifying that a new era in salvation history had arrived, See Rom 7 7 through 12, Gal 3 23 through 4 7, Kim, Paul, and the New Perspective, 22, 45, Meyer, End of the Law. The early church also continued to affirm monotheism, even while holding that Jesus was Lord. Jesus himself affirmed the Shema as the greatest commandment, Mark 12 29 through 30, Deuterium 6 4 through 5. Paul, John, and James attest to the central tenet of Judaism in their writings, John 17 3, Rom 3 30, 1 Cor 8 4, Gal 3 20, F 4 6, 1 Tim 2 5, JAS 219. In his trials, Paul sought to demonstrate that the early church faithfully worshipped the God of Israel, Acts 24 14 through 15, 12 3, People of the Spirit, 60. Nevertheless, the early church reworked its confession of monotheism to include Jesus in the identity of God, 1 CORA 4 through 6, Bokham, Jesus and the God of Israel, 1 27, 39, 2 10, 18. Philippians 2 and Colossians 1 indicate that Christians worshipped Jesus as if he was God, Hurtado, Lord Jesus Christ, 1 21, 23, 134, 53, Contra Dunn, Partings of the Ways, 266, 70, see also Pliny the Younger and Letters 10.96.7.
Romans 9 May 5th be a doxology to Jesus as God, Metzger, the punctuation of Rom 9 colon 5, 95, 112, Contra Dun, Romans 9, 16, 529. The Early Church as the Eschatological Community Although the early church was related to Judaism, it began to develop a separate identity early on, Contra Dun, Partings of the Ways, 343, 46. In the ancient world, ethnic identity was constructed around lines of social characteristics, kinship, and religious affiliation, Sekrest, a former Jew. Conversion to Christianity included a transformation that affected a person's deepest commitments of kinship and social ties. This ecclesial self-conception explains why Paul viewed the church as a third constituent element of humanity, 1 COR 1032, 1 PET 29, which was why the early church preferred to address one another in familial language, and why later generations could conceive of the church as a third race, e.g., letter to Dionysus 1.1, martyrdom of Polycarp 3.2, 14.1, 17.1, Clement of Alexandria and Stromata June 5, 41. Paul's claims that, prior to his conversion, he persecuted the Church of God, Kappa Kappa Lam Data Sigma Alpha Tau Omicron Theta Epsilon Omicron, He Ecclesia Theo Euthia, Gal 113, 1 COR 15 9, Phil 3 6, see also Gal 122, suggests that Christians in Jerusalem and Judea adopted the designation Church or Assembly, Kappa Kappa Lam Data Sigma Alpha, Ecclesia, rather early, Tri Bilko, Why Did, 442, 43. If the term was first used by the Christians in Jerusalem, it likely was chosen for theological rather than political reasons, Tri Bilko, Why Did, 445, Contra Van Kutten, Kappa Kappa Lam Data Sigma Alpha Tau Omicron Theta Epsilon Omicron, Ecclesia Theo Euthia, 522, 48. The Septuagint used the Greek term meaning church or assembly, Kappa Kappa Lam Data Sigma Alpha, Ecclesia, to translate the Hebrew term assembly, Kahal. Thus, the Greek term assembly, Kappa Kappa Lam Data Sigma Alpha, Ecclesia, likely expressed the early church's conviction that it was the fulfillment and culmination of the Old Testament people of God, Kinzel Man, Outline, 254, 55. The early church understood itself to be the eschatological community, the recipient of God's end through of through time saving promises, compare 1 QM 4 and 10, Becker, Paul the Apostle, 315, 18. The Old Testament had promised that in the last days God would pour out his spirit and make all things new, Esa 32 15, 44 3, Joel 2 28. At Pentecost, the early church interpreted the spirit's presence among them as the sign that God's promises had arrived, Acts 2 14 through 40, 12 3, people of the spirit, 74, 83. The early church conceived of itself as a new humanity in a new creation, for the old world had died along with its structures, 1 COR 1032, 2 COR 516 through 17, Gal 615, F215, Martin, Theological Issues, 87, 140. This eschatological focus explains why the early church could refer to its era as the fullness of time, Gal 44, or the last days, Acts 217, 1 COR 1011, 2 Tim 31, Heb 1 2, 1 Pet 120, 1 John 218, in which the righteousness of God had been manifested ultimately in Christ, Rom 3 21 through 22. The Early Church and Idolatry As the true Israel and eschatological community, the early church was to flee idolatry. Idolatry was widespread in the Greco through Roman world of the first century, and many believers, especially outside of Palestine, would have converted from lives of paganism. The conversion to Christianity could have had massive socio-economic ramifications on believers, who may have found themselves shunned by their former communities. Paul and the other New Testament writers taught Christians to hold fast to their monotheistic confession of Jesus as Lord, 1 COR 12 3, see also Phil 2 11. Paul reminds the Corinthians of their common confession that, despite there being many gods and many lords, there is but one God, 1 COR 8 4 through 5. In 1 Corinthians 8 6 he rewards Judaism's confession of monotheism, Deuterium 6 4, to include Jesus, for us there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, 1 COR 8 6, F 4 4 through 6, Bachham, Jesus and the God of Israel, 2 10, 18. The New Testament writers also provided new believers with instructions on how to live within a polytheistic world, e.g., 1 COR 8 1 through 11 1. Paul called believers to flee idolatry, 1 COR 10 14, and John advised his readers to keep yourselves from idols, 1 John 5 21. Christians were to refrain from eating meat offered to idols in the idols' temples, 1 COR 8 1 through 13, 10 14 through 22. The presence of dining rooms in and around the sanctuary to Demeter and Korah on the Acro Corinth indicate that eating and religious ritual were often bound together in the ancient world, Gooch, dangerous food. 1, 13. Gooch argues that an objective separation between meals eaten in an idol's temple and meals involving idolatrous rites was highly improbable in Paul's Corinth, Gooch, dangerous food, 82. Hence, believers were to abstain from eating in an idol's temple, although they were free to eat meat offered to idols, so long as they did not cause a weaker brother to stumble, 1 COR 8 9 through 13, 10 23 through 11 1, Phi, idolatida once again, 1 72, 97, compare Fisk, eating meat, 49, 70. Acts 19 23 through 41 illustrates how dangerous the church's rejection of idols was for its followers especially new converts. Paul's teaching in Ephesus that gods made with hands were not true gods threatened the livelihoods of idol makers and silversmiths, who made their profit from selling idols. 
In response to Paul's teaching, the silversmith Demetrius instigated a riot, see Acts 19.23-41. through 41. The Unity of the Early Church The early church sought to be unified around a common confession and practice. Jesus had described his family as those who did his father's will, Mark 3.34-35, through 35, and are not ashamed to call believers brothers, have 2.11 ESV. In Matthew 23.8 he instructed his disciples to call one another brother, Matt 23.8. The apostles thought of the church as a family and frequently spoke and wrote in familial terms, Acts 9.30, 15.13, Rom 12.1, 1 Cor 7.29, Gal 4.12, Heb 3.12, Jas 2.1, 2 Pet 1.10, 1 John 3.13. Such language portrays a deep unity in the church, Secrest, a former Jew, 1.18.33. The early church demonstrated its unity in the regular observance of the Lord's Supper. Following Pentecost, the early church partook of the supper on a weekly or even daily basis, Acts 2.42-47, 27, 1 Cor 11 17 through 34, Didache 14.1, Van Nest, Lord's Supper, 370, 72. Their breaking of bread together in commemoration of Jesus' death and resurrection was a sign of unity around the gospel. Paul makes this clear in 1 Cor 10 16 through 17 when he affirms that there is one body of Christians precisely because there is one bread. Hence, when believers do not act in patient and selfless unity, the supper loses its unifying significance, 1 Cor 11 17 through 34, Schreiner, New Testament Theology, 732, 33.